Good morning, Danielle. Good morning, Glenn. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. This is Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Uh, and I'm with uh, Professor Danielle Allen, who is uh, the, uh, who are you? Uh, the James Bryant Conant University Professor and Director yes. of the Edmund Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University and a columnist, a regular columnist at the Washington Post. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate you joining me this morning, uh, Danielle, to talk about the crisis of the day and the big ideas that uh, that it calls to our mind. Uh, the crisis of the day, of course, being the coronavirus pandemic. So thank you very much, uh, Danielle. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. You had a piece just yesterday uh, in the Post that uh, uh, put forward some ideas about uh, how you and your uh, colleagues are thinking about uh, responding to this uh, uh, pandemic. And I wonder if you'd be willing to describe those ideas. And more than that, to talk about the process that led you and your colleagues to develop these ideas uh, as a model for how it is that public intellectuals should be, um, you know, functioning in this uh, new environment that we're in. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate the chance to talk about these things. Um, so let me first tell you what the key ideas are, and then I will tell you the story of how we got to the development of these ideas. Okay. So there are basically three main ideas. Um, a lot of the conversation about coronavirus has been structured um, around how to think about a trade-off between lives lost to the virus and lives lost or negatively impacted by economic damage. And our first argument is that that is actually the wrong way of thinking about the question, that it's, we're not actually in a state where our institutions and underlying social structure are stable enough to permit that kind of trade-off decision-making. Instead, um, the right framework for decision-making in the moment comes out of just war theory. Um, in, so the point of just war theory is that you need a whole society response to protect a society from an existential threat. And so what you're asking is how do we marshal all our resources, our economic resources, our human resources, and so forth, to preserving the foundations of a stable and healthy society that can deliver health and education and employment to people. Excuse um, me for interrupting. This seems such sure. an important point. I want to make sure I understand it. What are the two opposed ways of thinking? This is a kind of meta point. This is not the answer. It's how one tries to get an answer. What are these That's two right. opposed ways of thinking? Again, so there's a sort of, a, a, you know, utilitarian cost benefit po policy analysis that we use all the time when we're in stable, steady states, social okay. states. And a lot of people have been trying to use that kind of reasoning to think about this problem. And so they think that it's a sort of trade off of lives under sort of two different conditions. Yes. But if you think about wartime, that's not how we think about their trade offs, right? So, for example, um, when a country is gearing up to fight a war, um, the war is going to do damage to the economy. You don't decide whether to fight or not, depending on whether or not you're going to lose more people if you fight versus whether or not there's going to be damage to the economy and you're going to lose people that way. You know you have to fight because there's a question of survival at stake. And so then the question is rather, how do you fight justly? And so that's a matter of, okay, how do you fit the economy for purpose um, for fighting? I Right. And then, yes, um, you're going to lose lives, but how do you minimize loss of life? And how do you protect the vulnerable? How do you protect non-combatants? How do you protect civil population, um, you know, um, civilian populations and so forth? So you're still making decisions that ultimately amount to choices about trade offs. But the decision making is not cast in a cost benefit trade off structure. It's cost rather in a structure of how do you maximize your capacity to ensure survival in the face of existential threat? in ways that are consistent with norms of justice so that you're, again, protecting the vulnerable, protecting non-combatants, um, you know, preceding the fight according to the norms of justice. Can I just observe here before you go on that? Uh, it occurs to me this is not entirely foreign to a cost benefit if you say that some kind of outcomes have, in effect, infinite costs. So you end up in a kind of lexicographic, you know, there's this priority that takes precedence right. over everything else. Correct. Implicitly, you're saying the costs associated with that are so large that they're Correct. incommensurate with anything else. And you Correct. But this point yes. about justice strikes Technically me. Technically speaking, that is absolutely a way that you can render it. But I think it's easier <laughs> if, you know, in ordinary conversation um, with a broad public to help them recognize that the kind of um, intellectual frameworks that you use for thinking in wartime are the ones that apply here. Fair enough. Go on, please. Okay, so that was point one. Okay, so then our second point is that 
once you recognize that, you can see that then, okay, it's a question of which policy approach do we use for fighting a war? And there have basically been three policy approaches mooted so far. There's one that we call freeze. There's one that we call surrender. And then there's the one that we call and advocate for mobilize and transition. So freeze is the one that um, you've read about where people are proposing um, you need to sort of have aggressive social distancing um, in repeated applications over a period of 12 to 18 months. And then everybody has been um, responding by saying, but look at the economic toll that that would cause. Right. We can't really do that. And so then the counter response to that is, okay, well, what you have to do is freeze the economy in place. So you basically sort of produce stimulus packages that tide over companies and workers so companies don't have to fire and rehire and so forth. And you sort of take that friction out of um, the process of maintaining the economy over time. So Denmark is the example of this, right, where they're putting a huge <coughs> of GDP into trying to carry firms and workers sort of through a period of repeated applications of social distancing. We call that freeze in place. The idea is that at the end of the pandemic crisis, the economy resumes its activity in the same shape that it had before the crisis. Okay, that's, you know, the in principle notional idea, right? So that's freeze in place. Surrender is the view that the costs um, of, to the economy are so great that we should just let the virus run its course to try to achieve herd immunity and move on with our lives. So that's the picture where 60% of the population gets infected. In the U.S., that means 2 million deaths, and then the economy runs on. There, you know, just from a kind of cost-benefit point of view, that is actually the most expensive approach. Right? Well, that's only if that 2 million number is the right number. Um, there's a lot of good reason to think it is. I mean, if you let it compl- run completely unimpeded and there's not even, you know, if, if presumably there would be some just sort of natural social distancing because people themselves would be fearful. So that might bring the number down, but it, it's, it would be in that territory. And that's consistent with pandemic modeling that the CDC has been doing for a very long time. Um, so it's not, you know, it's a credible number um, that the deaths would be at that scale if you just let the disease run unimpeded. Um, so, and then the third one, mobilize and transition, is the policy paradigm that recognizes that what you need to do when you're fighting a war is mobilize your economy to fight the war. So you don't just freeze the economy in place, you actually you know, recompose the economy as quickly as you can um, while sustaining output simultaneously, and then output is generated as you invest in the things you need to do to fight the war. And in our case, what that means to fight the war is we do need a period of aggressive social distancing up front, with sort of what we're in now, to bring the reproduction rate of the virus down below one, meaning that for every infected person, you have fewer than one further infected people. Currently, we're well above one for our reproduction rate number. We're probably somewhere over two um, currently, which is where the Spanish flu was as well, just so that people sort of have a sense of it. Um, And then um, basically, um, but while you're doing that upfront work, what you also need to be doing is investing in what people have typically called pandemic preparedness. It could be better called pandemic resilience, which is the sort of set of things that you could have to do if you want to actually keep your economy moving during a pandemic so that people can keep being active even during a pandemic. And that's the model that the Asian nations nations have developed, so Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, and so forth. So that's really high-volume testing, in effect, universal testing. Given where we currently are in the epidemic, for us that would mean literally 5 million tests a day across the country, okay? And then contact tracing um, based on technology, tech app, apps that permit people to quickly communicate um, to about where they've been and so forth. So then you can communicate with everybody, say, who's in that subway car with the person, that they've been in a subway car with somebody with the virus, um, plus um, testing around immunity so that you can let sort of people with immunity, provable immunity, continue to function in the economy and also deploy them in various kind of frontline first responders. So a fair amount of retraining as well, supporting that sort of shift of the workforce to the sort of services that are necessary to fighting the virus. So if you can do all those things in a period of, say, one month to six weeks to max three months of aggressive social distancing, then you can bring the reproduction number down sufficiently that then you can use the kind of containment strategies that rest on these other tools to keep managing the virus over time. So there'd be outbreaks and so forth here and there, but you wouldn't have to shut down the entire economy to manage them. That's the mobilize and transition um, paradigm. So, and when we kind of map out the relative costs of these, the, in the U.S., the freeze paradigm, on our view, would probably cost a total of 10 to 15 trillion. And the 
the stimulus that was just passed the other day should only be seen as a down payment because it wouldn't carry us through on that model. The surrender one costs you know, more in the order of 10 to 20 trillion um, when you're looking at number of lives lost, just measured in the kind of conventional uh, life year um, estimate figure that policymakers use. Um, and then mobilize and transition, we estimate at two to three billion um, to get that um, upfront work of recomposing the economy and supporting output simultaneously um, going so that you can move forward with um, a pandemically resilient economy. And then the, the last thing to say is that the benefit of that approach is that you leave the crisis prepared for the next pandemic, whereas freeze, you leave the crisis and man, you know, like five years down the road, you could have the same thing happen again. Political feasibility. We're in the United States of America. You know the country that we're in. Uh, It's a very huge, diverse country, and there's going to be tremendous resistance to any kind of mobilization on the scale that you're talking about, particularly since the incidence of the malady is not evenly distributed across, you know, region and so forth and across demography. It will Uh, be (laughs) if we don't do anything. I mean, that's the thing about it. I mean, that's just very straightforward. And there's just no question about that from any of the kind of work in epidemiology or sort of history of epidemics and so forth. Um, I mean, it will be evenly distributed um, unless we do these things. So um, the people who are currently in a good state should be all the more interested in investing in the structure and tools of containment in their community because they are actually in a position to avoid what New York is experiencing. You know, they are, say, where South Korea was at the beginning of this, and this is their moment. Like They could do South Korea now, and that would be much less expensive for them than not supporting this general kind of effort and mobilization. So with regard to the kind of political feasibility, so it's a big lift, no question. However, um, I think there's good reason to think that the conversation is converging um, so that we are starting to see um, in different communities of analysis a shared perspective of this approach of of upfront intense investment so that we can transition to a containment model alongside the um, sort of suppression model. Um, There's convergence there. So um, what we're trying to do is drive this conversation into all the different networks where it's relevant. So what are those networks? Just to be really clear about it. There's the White House task force um, on the pandemic. There's the National Governors Association There's an association of cities and mayors working to respond to the COVID pandemic. Um, There are groups of people who are working on the question of how could you activate a kind of national service volunteer corps um, in relationship to this. Um, There are um, groups of technology companies um, starting to try to talk about this because they could bring a lot to it. If they could get the kind of contact tracing infrastructure up, you know, in a month's time, that would transform everything. Um, There's an industrial consortium having conversations about this kind of thing. Um, you'll have seen some of that in the news with the, when the sort of discussion about the ventilator production with GM and the other sort of auto manufacturers. Yeah, I've seen that. So that's, I mean, I think that's that network of conversation. Um, you know, it's, I think that's a moving piece. How well that's converging to this yet is not yet clear to me. I noticed but, that uh, the federal administration, the uh, White House didn't uh, figure in that, in that uh, list. No, no, I did. I started out with that, the task force, the White House task force. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so I think... Um, no, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. There's, there's you know, that, the, that, that's the goal, is to drive the conversation through all those channels and try to achieve convergence, and there's some reason to think that that convergence is beginning. Okay, now you're talking about technology in, in terms of testing and stuff, but what about in terms of uh, treatment for uh, people who are sick, or in terms of uh, vaccine I mean, developments down the road, but that would significantly alter the the uh, the situation if they were in hand. Do you factor that? So, I mean, we certainly. So, the so the third thing I was going to say when I said we were, there are three ideas. The first idea was that let's use the just war theory frame for thinking about this. The second idea was let's use a mobilized and transition policy frame. And then the third idea was the specific economic strategy that I've just started to describe of the kind of recompensation and output for the economy and moving fast on that. And so um, on that, um, then that last point, that economic strategy should include, um, you know, ex- even further accelerating investment in research and development around therapies and vaccines and so forth. It's just that you, we, you can't control the timetables of those. And so in that regard, you can't really 
um, build a whole policy uh, making process on those things. And the important thing to know here is that while the scientific community is very adept at making influenza vaccines, and they can actually, if there's a new influenza virus that emerges, they can turn on a dime and pretty much within a month have a vaccine and get that distributed globally. Nobody has ever yet succeeded in producing a vaccine for a coronavirus. Okay, and so scientists say to that, well, we've never tried as hard as we're trying and that's cool, and that's great, and that might just sort of, um, you know, be the case that this time we're going to invest more and we, and we, like, figure it out and turn that corner. But there is just, like, this, you know, categorical difference that we know how to, to build, develop influenza viruses, and we've never done it for a coronavirus. Okay, so there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about the feasibility of a technical solution um, yeah. to the problem. Yeah. I'm interested in the um, multidisciplinary character of this uh brain trust that you pulled together. And by the way, congratulations and thank you for your intellectual leadership. Uh, I see the center the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard is on the case uh, here and we need you. But, uh, We're not alone. We're not alone. There's lots of people out there working on this. I want to say that, you know. She because said modestly. No, it's I mean, amazing uh, the work people are doing. So well, well, how do what do philosophers, uh, economists, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, epidemia. I mean, how do you how do you all talk to each other since you don't speak the same language? So I think um, you know that's been one of the really exciting parts of this work. So let me tell you the story of how this all came together, basically. So um, Ezekiel Emanuel, who is sort of vice provost at Penn, was in the Obama administration for health policy. Um, yeah. Published an op-ed in the New York Times a few weeks ago about rationing. Right, and the fact that we were moving pretty quickly to a position where we would have to make rationing decisions around ventilators and ICU beds and things like that. Please excuse me, but I'm drinking my breakfast here. And, okay, and uh, no worries. Carry on. <laughs> okay, so I reached out to him after he published that op-ed and said, "Okay, wow, you know, that's a wake-up call. Um, can you tell me what are the other questions that you feel need addressing in this space?" And he wrote back and said, "Look, the hardest one is this one about the trade-off between." lives lost to the virus and lives lost or harmed due to economic uh, damage. Yeah. Could you guys help with that? And so I said, okay, yeah, that's cool. We'll, we'll take a crack at helping with that. And so um, the first thing I did was sort of just try to kind of round out as big a group as I could, starting with faculty connected to our center and our center, I should say, uh, brings together philosophers and economists and political scientists and historians and sociologists and legal scholars and, epidemiologists and medical ethicists and so forth. So I reached out to our kind of core group and then asked them for help in bringing in other people with the relevant um, expertise. Um, and we just sort of started setting up brainstorming calls to break the problem into pieces and to divide it up, sort of who would work on what. But I think the benefit of having this kind of big group was that because we had the philosophers in the mix alongside the positive social scientists, um, we, from the, the very beginning, sort of started with kind of questions of like, well, what are the kind of core purposes, the core values that should help us uh, work our way through decision making? Um, and that was the sort of conversation that led us from the transition to, you know, uh, pardon the expression, but like a kind of more narrowly utilitarian perspective to the sort of sophisticated one you articulated about infinite <laughs> costs uh, or what, you know, we would call kind of just war theory um, framework. Um, and that really opened up sort of a lot of powerful pathways for further thinking, basically. So I feel like what we had was kind of model of um, intellectual collaboration that permitted us to bring um, values and positive analyses of the empirical facts on the ground together um, in sort of both diagnosing the situation and figuring out what the kind of array of prescription possibilities um, is. Um, for me, this feels like a very different kind of way of working than what has been the norm um, under the sort of more technocratic approaches of um, neoliberalism, where I think um, the kind of sort of narrow cost-benefit analysis has been locked in with a certain set of paradigms, um, prioritizing um, policy pathways that um, sort of, in the first instance, look straight at market solutions and so forth. So, I mean, there's a lot more to be said about the contrast, but I think um, having all those disciplines together in one space made for really fertile intellectual ground for opening up um, creative possibilities. Say more about the contrast, because I, I confess that my instinct as an economist trained in late 20th century, uh, conventional neoliberal, uh, neoclassical economics, 
is to think precisely in terms of uh, trade-offs, costs, and benefits at the margin. Um, I recognize that this is an extraordinary circumstance, but I worry about command center-driven center, uh, command and control decisions that are not sufficiently sensitive to cost because uh, they are, uh, you know, fetishizing or placing in center place uh, uh, one single concern, climate change, for example, without taking, I give that as another example, without taking on board the uh, knock-on uh, consequences for people, uh, which uh, uh, when they add up over uh, hundreds of millions of people end up being a very significant thing. So, so I mean, say more about why yeah. this trade-off thinking is, is inadequate to the situation. So I think the important thing is that the relevant contrast is not between just uh, sort of trade-off thinking and marginal costs and market-driven uh, solutions and command and control uh, centralized decision-making. Um, so I think we're trying to put a third thing on the table, um, So, um, which is to say that what one, there are certain kinds of um, decisions and choices that do really require um, collective decision-making and coordination. Um, but those don't have to be command and control, top-down driven processes. So what does that mean exactly? Um, so, um, so in the first instance, there's the contrast we were talking about between um, sort of you know, on-the-margin cost-benefit decisions in a steady-state circumstance and sort of existential moments where actually what you're having to do is figure out how to secure the foundations of a functioning society. And securing the foundations of a functioning society requires understanding things like political institutions and legitimacy and social cooperation and coordination, social cohesion, um, as well as understanding the specific kind of economic transactional um, consequences of one or another um, decision. And so the question is, how do you marry those kinds of expertise together um, in a decision-making process? So we need mobilization. And it's true that you might have a kind of model that says, okay, well, let's just go ahead and like absolutely make everything that we're going to do here centralized. Like let's just have a, have the president use the National Defense Authorization Act or whatever right. and, you know, totally socialize and nationalize the economy and like let's move forward like that. Right. That is one model. That's not the only necessary model. The other thing that you can do is clarify what the sort of shared direction is in which we all need to be pulling and what different sectors with their different kinds of expertise can do in alignment and coordination with each other. So that's partly why we're working so hard to really crystallize a paradigm that can be disseminated and provide people with a framework for their own decision-making um, on the idea that you can actually coordinate a whole lot of what we need without actually requiring kind of command and control, top-down knowledge. And so, in fact, if you read our um, economic strategy paper, we make the argument that for all the different kind of categories of decision, the ideal thing is for those decisions to be made as close to the actually experienced as possible so that you have like different levels of decision making and choice making. So we're working on a really federated structure, decentralized structure of decision making. We're trying to be really, really, really clear and precise. And this is the part we're working on now and we haven't actually gotten done yet. Like what are the very specific things, like two to five things that you really do need the federal government specifically to do as opposed to other entities. Um, and so that's the, you know, we haven't answered that question yet because they sort of put your finger on an important piece of it. But the, but the point is that the, there's a third model here. So it's not just like the market model, the command and control sort of, let's say, socialist model or something of that sort. Um, there's a third model of federated, coordinated, um, well-organized um, action that both combines um, the sort of, market sort of price sensitive decision making with the kind of decision making that comes out of uh, collective action coordination attention to um, what institutions require for stability and functioning. I see. Um, hey, you will not have failed to notice that we're in an election year. Um, I'm worried about the extent to which we can do these two things at the same time as a national community. <laughs> decide on the future of the political direction by choosing uh, an executive on the one hand and implement far reaching interventions required by the emergency uh, of the sort that you're describing on the other. Uh, have you thought much at all about how the political partisan environment that we live in interacts or intersects, I should say, with the agenda that you're that you're propounding? 
Well, to be honest, I haven't given as much thought as I'm sure I should have by now, but um, I think that one might be kind of basic in the sense that it may be that the partisans, the sense like the sort of active um, contenders, you know, in the fray of partisan combat have that question front and center. But the truth is, I think most Americans are actually not going to think about that question again until about September. And so in that regard, we should might as well understand that the election is on pause. And then depending on where we are in September, everything will turn. Where we are in September will determine the election. I I think it's that simple. That's interesting. Um, Where do you think we're going to be in September in terms of the pandemic here in the U.S.? (laughs) I mean, okay, so this is one of those places where everybody says, like, Danielle, your problem is that you are um, uh, just in a permanent optimist. Um, So I always say it's not that it's optimism, it's that I feel like um, it's, it's we have no choice in some. So from <laughs> my view, we have no choice but to achieve this mobilization um, because otherwise we will either have like massive numbers of people dead and all of the incredible social impact and trauma that comes from that, or we will have an economy that has been so badly degraded that we have all of the social trauma that comes from that. So we don't really have a choice. Um, we've got to mobilize. So I would say by September, my expectation is that we will have mobilized and that we will be um, have found a way to manage the disease and we will be trying to rebuild an economy that is badly damaged um, and console our fellow um, Americans, fellow members of this community who are suffering from the shock of a sort of surprise and devastating loss but that neither of those things will be on the magnitude of what they might have been. Now, I watched President Trump in one of his uh, briefings a few days ago uh, do what I thought was a pivot in which he started talking about, uh, you know, the cure can't be worse than the disease and uh, Easter is a target date to kind of start opening up and stuff like that. And I thought, no, we're not going to open up by Easter, but I see what he's trying to do. He's trying to seed the conversation in a way Mm -hmm. to allow for the possibility of some kind of opening up the the exact nature of which is unclear. Yep. Um, That sounds like surrender in your vocabulary. Uh, And I don't see it being obvious that that won't happen uh, because of the the terrible burden of cost that so many people are bearing by being uh, shuttered. So um, Easter would be a surrender, but I think what's happening with that pivot from the president is um, something sort of bigger than that, which is I think it's, you know, it it was almost a request for proposals, right? Um, That is, it was sort of saying, look, this policy paradigm where we're shuttered for 12 to 18 months is insane. And the truth is, it is is. insane. Yeah, we won't survive it. We won't. So it was it was a request for proposals is how I understood that. That's interesting. President. So, okay, well, what are the proposals for alternatives? So we say we've got one. It's not, you know, not going to get there by Easter, like no way. But but you can actually do that of, you know, again, mobilize for the containment strategy and then you can open up. Um, So the question is just like, how long does that mobilization for the containment strategy actually take? And that's where sort of estimates kind of differ between six weeks and three months. Is it wrong for me to ask the question about what does all of this do to the prospects of the Democrats in the upcoming presidential election? Yeah, I would say, like, let's see in September. We'll know. Let's put that one on hold. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't even need to ask it because the answer will be clear. Okay. well, um, thanks very much, Danielle. I know you've got a lot of things to do, and I appreciate you sharing uh, your wisdom with us uh, here at the Glenn Show. You know, Glenn, it was fun to talk to you. It is always fun to talk to you. And um, you. this was actually probably the most relaxing thing I've had the chance to do in the last few weeks. So my goodness. <laughs> you for a little bit of restoration or R&R, so to speak. So Okay. Well, we should have another conversation in September or whatever, uh, assuming that your uh, optimistic forecast is right. And I sure pray that it is. <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, because no I want to argue, argue what's wrong with economics uh, as a more, uh, you know, general question right. uh, with you, uh, my friend. Thanks for okay. coming on the show. Great to see you, Glenn. Okay, you take too. care. Bye-bye.